So in the last video, we saw how to align a laser beam through a set of two apertures like these ones. This was extremely interesting, but it's not ultimately what you would like to achieve. What you want to do is to get your laser beam passed through the center of either a microscopy objective like this one or through a lens. And that's exactly what we will see in this video. And we will also see that it's bringing a lot of interesting questions like why does some lens have a center and some do not? Let's take a simple ball lens. It's just a perfect sphere of transparent material like glass. If we send our laser beam through the lens, we see that it experiences refraction. We see that the beam direction clearly changes when the beam enters and exits the lens. We can do the same for any incoming rays, whatever its orientation, but there is one very particular type of ray where the beam does not change as the ray passes through the lens. It's just like there was no lens at all. We can check this here by removing the ball lens and seeing that the ray is not affected by the presence of the lens. We say that the ray is on the optical axis of the lens. For a ball lens, this happens when the ray passes through the center of the sphere. Any ray that passes through the center of the ball lens will remain unchanged and is therefore on optical axis. Note that a ray that passes through the center of the lens after refraction, should say this ray, is not an optical axis because you have refraction this time, which means that the beam orientation will have changed when it passes through the lens. So why is it so important to get your laser beam passed through the optical axis of a system? As we said, it's the only ray that will not experience refraction. And no refraction, that means no aberration. And it's therefore extremely important to get your laser beam as close as possible to the optical axis of the system, just to minimize the amount of aberration and to get better overall image quality. That being said, ball lenses are quite an unusual object, and most lenses are actually made of two different radius of curvature. Spherical lenses are actually made by grinding spherical surface on a glass cylinder called the blank. You can see a lens as the intersection of two spheres, such as shown here. Just like for the ball lens, the optical axis is defined as the ray that experiences no refraction as it passes through the lens. Here it's not a ray that passes through the center of curvature of both surfaces, and unlike the ball sphere, there is only one optical axis this time. Planospherical lens, that means lens that are made of one spherical surface and one planar surface, are just an extension of the regular case. You can see a planar surface as a sphere with an infinite radius of curvature. Its center is therefore located at infinity. The consequence is that the optical axis of a planospherical lens is the ray that passes through the center of curvature of the spherical part and that is perpendicular to the plane side. At this point, some of you probably already found the trick to align the lens with the laser beam, and that's what I'm going to discuss now. We see the optical axis of the lens here. Now observe that the lens edge forms a cylinder whose axis is the same as the optical axis. We call this the mechanical axis of the lens. So it might be tempting to use the mechanical axis of a lens to align the lens with the laser beam. And that's precisely the, the reason I like so much to use cage system like this one. Because typically, I could first align my laser beam through the two apertures, then remove one of the apertures and put the lens instead, and the beam will go through the center of the lens. Be aware, however, that although this works for most experimental systems, when you are looking for precision, it's not going to be enough. Here I've shown a cage system with two apertures and a glass lens. We assume that the optical axis of the lens will match the line defined by the two apertures because all elements are cylinder mounted on the same cage system. But multiple things can go wrong here. First, you have no guarantee that the apertures are actually centered in their mount. When you start investigating, you discover that Torlabs does not guarantee anything about it. If you get in touch with their technical support, they will say that they should be centered within 100 micron, but no guarantee is ever offered. Second, we have assumed that the lens mechanical axis perfectly matched the lens optical axis. This is actually never exactly the case and I will show you why. When the lens is manufactured, it needs to be repositioned between the greening of the front and the greening of the back surface and of the edge. And every time the lens is removed from its tool, it's very hard to get the exact same alignment again. Typically, the two surfaces will be offset from each other. 
The consequence is that the optical axis is now skewed compared to the mechanical axis defined by the edge of the lens. This is called lens decentration and it's measured in arc minutes. A typical high precision lens will have between 2 and 6 arc minutes of decentration. So holding the lens by its edge is probably one of the worst things you can do in optomechanical design engineering. And typically you should never use this cage system of turlaps that just take the, the lens by their edge because you won't get satisfactory results. It's already much better to use pre-mounted lens or if you can afford it to make your own optical mounts with tolerance fits so that you are sure that the different mechanical axes will perfectly align when you do a lens uh, assembly. Uh, typically with custom mount you can achieve decentration on the order of 50 micrometer or a few arc minutes of decentration. To understand why, let's imagine this plano convex lens. We can place the lens on a mechanical edge and since it's a spherical lens, we can rotate it any way we want. When we rotate the lens, it's rotating around the center of curvature. The top surface will rotate around the same point. If we now apply a force on the top surface along a circular edge, we can force the lens to rotate until the optical axis aligns itself with the mechanical axis defined by the two edges. The only limit is the precision at which we can align the top mechanical edge with the bottom mechanical edge. And if it's not enough, some companies will even propose to do diamond turning on already mounted lens such that the mechanical axis is almost exactly equal to the uh, optical axis. And I've used this technique in the past. You can achieve um, very tight tolerance down to the micrometer level for the decentration and it's typically required for extremely high precision optics. It will obviously come with a price, but sometimes you really don't have the choice. Last but not least, this brings us to the concept of lens assemblies, because most of the devices are actually an assembly of multiple lens. You can see here a typical optical design of a microscope assembly. There are various techniques to hold the lens together, but let's assume that they are mounted in individual barrels like we've seen. And because all of the lens are held together from their mount, which never perfectly match the optical axis as we say it, each of the lens will be slightly skewed compared to the other. The consequence is that there is no single optical axis in the system, but a collection of multiple optical axes, one per element. There are then no rays that will never experience refraction, and there will always be aberration in the system. And because of the mechanical tolerance, each time you will assemble your system, you will get a very slightly different layout of optical axis and different amount and type of aberration. That means you will never get two systems to behave exactly the same and each will have its own image quality. Usually the more decentration, the worse image quality that you will get. And there are two things you can do about this. It's either you can use higher precision mounting for the lens to reduce the decentration of individual components, or you can go for an optical design that's less subject to decentration effect, but that usually means that you will need more lens into the system and so that your system will be more expensive uh, anyway at the end. So what's the takeaway of all this? Well, first it's an excellent thing to use cage system and it's really an improvement over just putting the elements at random place on your optical breadboard and trying to get your signal pass through. Also, we saw that it's better to use pre-mounted lens or to make custom mounts and that using this kind of, uh, of mounts that hold the lens by the edge is one of the worst things that you can do, so you should really avoid that. Also, we saw that when it's about lens assemblies, you really need to take into account the concept of decentration, but that's going really uh, way beyond the scope of this video as it's going into the, the topic of uh, tolerance analysis in optical design that we will show one day later when I have time. I hope that you enjoyed the video and learned some valuable stuff about decentration process and optical axis in a lens system. And if you like the video, don't forget to subscribe, have a look at our Patreon page, and already a big thanks to all of the Patreon members who are supporting the channel right now and are making this possible. So see you next month.